Oh, Father in heaven, you are so grateful for the most precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We, we stand amazed that you love the world so much, every one of us, that you gave your one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we're here to celebrate this wonderful gift, and we pray that you'll open the hearts this evening of everyone anew, and that, Lord, you soften someone's heart tonight to receive that gift, that wonderful gift of grace for the very first time, for your glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 2, 1 through 7. Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them.
And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah of the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his faith rests. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. 
which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. <coughs>
You may be seated. This week on social media, I put two questions out there to see how people would respond. The first question was, what was the most memorable or thoughtful Christmas gift you've ever received? And the second question was, what was the most thoughtless or useless Christmas gift you've ever received? And some of the thoughtless and useless ones were really funny. Somebody said she got a bunch of kids' Tupperware to pack her kids' lunches, and she commented, that was a gift for them and a chore for me. <laughs> Someone else commented that the worst gift they'd ever received were sushi magnets from a family they nannied for, which I'm assuming are fridge magnets? They look like sushi, but I don't know. They didn't post a picture. Another person wrote, one of the most useless gifts they had ever received was a singing reindeer that you put on your toilet and it sings while you're doing your business. <laughs> but it does make me smile, they wrote. That one was, was my favorite. Those are some of the funny ones. Now, some of the more memorable gifts that people share, one person shared about a cloth book that a friend from theirs sewed for them by hand that had pictures in it, that had sayings, that had song lyrics in them. Another shared about a scrapbook that her husband made for her, and she wrote, it was so beautiful, even with all the duct tape. I'm not sure how duct tape makes it into a scrapbook, but uh, leave that to a man, I guess. Someone else wrote this one. They wrote, two years ago, I was struggling to get Christmas gifts for my kids. I put everything on layaway, and right before my balance was due, I had the money to pay for it, but once I paid for it, I would have been broke. I went to pay for the layaway, and when I got there, it was $100 cheaper than what I expected. And so I questioned the cashier, and they didn't understand why. While we were talking, another worker overheard our conversation and said a man had come in and donated a large sum of money to be put on random layaways. Mine was one selected. To me, that was a wonderful gift. Needless to say, I cried and thanked God. That was a great one. The gifts that are the most memorable to us tend to be the most meaningful because of the thought and the love that's behind them. Which is really fitting for Christmas because God's greatest gift to us is the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, so there's this love behind His thoughtfulness for what He's about to give, that He gave His one and only Son. Then whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The gift of eternal life. Uh, one year early on when Michelle and I were married, we sent out these Christmas cards. And I, I, I wrote down what they said them because it was, I thought it was so good. It said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. So what I want to do tonight is look at just a few passages of Scripture surrounding the birth of Christ, and I want to spend a few moments meditating on what kind of gift God has given us in sending His Son, Jesus into the world. What kind of gift? So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 20 to 23. We read, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The first thing that I would like us to see as we meditate on what kind of gift God has given us in sending Jesus is God's gift is his presence. His gift is His presence. They will call Him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Presence is so powerful. 
I think for a lot of people this Christmas, one of the hardest things will be having to spend it distanced from some of the people that we love the most. People we would love to be present with because presence is powerful. But how many know God is not socially distanced from us? He doesn't have to keep a six foot distance. He doesn't have to quarantine for 10 days when he's been around someone with COVID. David in Psalm 139 writes, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He says, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Theologians call this the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere present all the time. So he's not socially distanced, but our sin causes us to be spiritually distanced from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God because of your sins he has turned away and will not listen anymore. So God sent Jesus into the world to deal with our problem of being spiritually distanced from God. To deal with our sin issue. To pay the penalty for our sin. Romans 6.23 says that the wages for our sin is death. Our sin deserves death. So Jesus died in our place to save us from our sins. That spiritually distances us from God. John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13 says, Jesus came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth coming from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, God is no longer spiritually distanced. He is with us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 puts it like this. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. Through a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are brought near to God. We are no longer socially distanced from Him. In sending Jesus, God was given us the gift of His presence. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12, we read this earlier while we were singing. We were told the shepherds were living out in the field, keeping flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and they were glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Now the second thing I want us to see as we meditate on what kind of gift God's given us in sending Jesus is God's gift is personal. It is personal. Notice all the personal pronouns in these short verses. I bring you good news. A Savior has been born to you. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes as the angel's talking to these shepherds. God's gift in sending Jesus was not so that we could practice some impersonal religion. It wasn't about following a list of rules or do's or don'ts. God sent Jesus into the world so that we could know him personally and intimately. How many of you have ever received a Christmas gift and the first thought that went through your mind was, what? in the world was this person thinking. Like, anybody ever received a gift like that? We were like, does this person even know me? I was in Kohl's one year, and I was looking to pick up one more Christmas gift for my wife. And instead of thinking about it ahead of time, what I was going to get, I decided to go to the store and be inspired. Bad idea. I am one of those people that if I don't go into the store where they list, I get distracted and I just wander around in circles and I do laps. So I'm wandering around Kohl's and I have an idea what to get for this last gift. And I'm looking at those middle aisle displays that they put up on Christmas. 
Another bad idea, don't buy stuff from the middle aisle displays. They put stuff there that you'll never use. There's things there like indoor s'mores kit, where you can make s'mores without a campfire, like over a candle. We actually, I'm pretty sure we have one of those. I don't think we ever used it. I think the graham crackers got stale, and the marshmallows, I'm not sure what happened to them. But I was looking at those kind of displays, with the s'mores and the, the fondue makers, like, you know what I'm talking about? And I saw this machine that makes smoothies. And I thought, that looks really cool. But I've got to be honest with you, I had never seen my wife up until that point consume a smoothie before. <laughs> not all the time we dated, not all the time we were married. She never talked about smoothies. She never asked for a smoothie. We never got smoothies when we went out. But for some reason, I got the idea that this would be a good idea. So I grabbed a blue one, took it to the checkout counter, brought it home, wrapped it up, and I, would, I can never forget the look on her face on <laughs> Sunday morning, Christmas morning. When she unwrapped it, the look just screamed, what the heck were you thinking? <laughs> and thankfully, I kept the receipt and graciously offered to return it, which was probably one of the best moves that I could have made. <laughs> God's gift to us in Jesus, however, is not thoughtless. It wasn't picked up on a middle aisle at Kohl's. It was personal. It was meaningful. The most meaningful gift we could ever receive God sent Jesus to give us the gift of eternal life. It is, eternal life is personal. It's all about knowing God. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who said, to know God in a personal way. Not just to know about Him. That word is a word that describes intimacy in the original language that it was written. The gift of the eternal life that Jesus came to give us was that we can know God personally and we can learn to love Him with our heart, with our mind, with our soul, with our strength. And then finally, the third thing that I want us to see when we meditate on what kind of gift God has given us in sending Jesus is God's gift was costly. God's gift to us was costly. The band Third Day does this, did this Christmas album years ago. And a lot of they had this song, Born in Bethlehem. And the first line says, Baby Jesus, born in a stable, humble Savior's birth. And then there's this line that says, You left your throne in heaven above to live here on the earth. Have you ever considered all that Jesus left in order to come to earth and give his life for us? John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. Jesus, in being God, enjoyed perfect fellowship in heaven with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And yet Philippians 2, 7 and 8 tells us that He made Himself nothing, the ESV translates that verse, He emptied Himself by taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's how much Jesus loves you. He was willing to leave behind what he had in heaven. He left his perfect place in heaven to come to this broken world. In heaven, Jesus is worshipped. He's exalted. On earth, he was going to be despised and rejected. In heaven, Jesus was called holy, he was called adored, but on earth he would be called a blasphemer and many other names. He would be spit on and beaten and crucified between two thieves. He gave his life that we might have eternal life. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to us knowing full well that some would reject him, that many would misunderstand him, his closest friends would abandon him and betray him. Relationships are very costly, aren't they? God's gift to us in sending Jesus cost him everything he had. So what can we do this Christmas with this kind of gift? The gift of God's presence. A gift that's personal, a gift that's Costly, I would encourage everyone to unwrap this gift and then re-gift it.
To unwrap it and re-gift it. Here's what I mean by that. Unwrap the gift of Jesus in your life. If you've never received the gift of salvation from your sins so that you can know God personally and spend eternity with Him, which starts the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can receive that gift right now. In this moment, when Peter shared that Jesus was the Lord and the Messiah in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says the people were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, what do we do? What do we do with this gift? And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This doesn't have to be anything profound. It doesn't have to be an eloquent prayer that you pray. You can use words that a preschooler would understand. Three simple words saying sorry, thank you, please. Those are three words that I learned from a very young age. Think about it. You can say something tonight like this. Jesus, I am sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life that have kept me spiritually distanced from you. Please forgive me. I turn from everything that I know is wrong. That's what it means to repent in that verse. I turn from what is wrong. Thank you that you died on a cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Anyone can make that decision. It's for all who would believe in Jesus. Now, if you've already made that decision, let me encourage this Christmas to keep unwrapping what that decision means. Because it's a lifelong process. There is, we can always experience more of God's presence in our life. We can always know God personally at a deeper and deeper level and experience more of His love and a deeper understanding of the cost that Jesus, that it took Jesus to come to us and the cost of what it means to follow Him. And that's how all relationships work, right? There's layers. And you just dump back layers and layers and layers. And that's how it is with God. In Psalm 51, 10, verses 10 to 12, David prays, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant a willing spirit to sustain me. My prayer has been that as you unwrap the gift tonight, that you would ask God to restore the joy of your salvation. The joy of being able to know God intimately, personally, at a deep level. To know the cost, how much He loves you. And then take that gift and re-gift it. How many of you have re-gifted a gift before? Be honest, raise your hands if you've re-gifted a gift. Right? I read a survey recently that said that 83% of adult Americans would not mind receiving a re-gifted present. And half of those who were pulled suspected that they had already received a re-gift in the past. Now, I would caution you to be careful about re-gifting gift cards, right? Because sometimes we forget whether we've used them or not. I listened to a podcast a little while back where the guy said he re-gifted a gift card. He thought it was unused, and the person he gave it to went to use it, and there was $2 left. <laughs> and so be careful about that kind of gift. When we re-gift a Christmas present, we're typically giving something that we're not going to use. That's not the case with Jesus. Here's a really cool thing. You get to keep all of him in your heart while offering all of him to others. Because there is enough of Jesus to go around for everybody. Remember the verse that I read earlier, John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So you can re-gift this gift that's been given to you again and again to anybody that you'd like to. Just sharing the good news. How do we do it? Same way Jesus did. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. Jesus lived among us. He dwelled among us. He was present with people. That's how we re-gift the gift that we've been given. We be present with people. Let people into your life so they can see the life of Jesus in you. 
So they can see God's glory oozing out of you. Make it personal. Be vulnerable. Get to know people. Get to know their story. Let them know your story. And then help them connect God's story to their story. Now there's, there's a cost to this. The cost is relationships are costly. Relationships can hurt. There is a risk. We will be misunderstood. We will be hurt. But it's worth it. It's worth it. What kind of gift has God given us in sending Jesus? He's given us the gift of his presence. A gift that's personal. And a gift that's costly. Unwrap that gift of Jesus this Christmas. Go deeper. And then re-gift him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for coming to us when we couldn't fix ourselves. You came to deal with what we could not deal with on our own. Our sin that was keeping us distanced from you. Thank you that you humbled yourself. You became a man. You became obedient to death, even death on a cross for us. And that through you, when we open our lives up to you, when we receive that gift, we can know God intimately, personally, passionately, deeply. We can unwrap that gift and we can re-gift it to others. May we meditate on that this Christmas season and beyond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Merry Christmas. I want to thank everybody for coming. Hey, if this is your first time you've ever been with us, we have services every Sunday, 9 and 11. We would love to have you back in person or online. If you'd like to get to know us, if you go to mylvc.org, we have an online connect card. We would love to meet you and get to know you. God bless you. Have a merry, merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.